Chapter Two. In the afternoon, Bio, Miss Ola, and I went to the sitting room to talk to Mr. Jensen. I had adopted father. That was what I've been referring him to since the day I realized he no longer wanted me. It was hard. He's still calling someone who didn't want me. My father was absurd. So now he went to Mr. Jensen to me. I wanted peace in this house, and I badly wanted to reconcile with him. Maybe things would go back to how it was, but I knew it was taking a risk. Mr. Jensen had changed from the loving father he was to a pathetic abuser. Sometimes I had to empathize with him whenever he was sorrowful and looking disheveled. In other times, I felt like strangling him to death. Whenever he touched my adopted mother, he stood there leaning against the wall and staring into his face. His white shirt and button, his hair, rough, and and unshaved. He had a bottle of tequila with him. God, I bet he is drunk. I thought. I took a step farther to meet him as Bazala tugged my coat, whispering. This is a wrong idea, please. Maybe another time, but not at this moment. I look at my eleven-year-old sister and sense she was scared, scared for every one of us. It's okay. My dad might hear us. It's now or never. It's your decision, Justin. Do you want to think it's best for you? Bayou said, with a sigh. I replied. He's probably pensive not to hear us. Let me just do it. It might soften his heart. I smiled at them as I ruffled the soul's hair. This was too much for just an eleven-year-old girl. She was supposed to be happy and not be troubled with whatever was going on in this house. I stepped forward and my heart started beating abnormally, for fear, unknown fear. Dad. I called before I realized I crossed my boundary by calling him Ted. I bit the inside of my cheek and called out again, "Mr. Johnson." He didn't hear me. He was no doubt pensive. I prayerfully took another step to Mr. Johnson and was greeted with a smell of cigarettes. Oh, really? He smokes now. Mr. Johnson, can I please have a word with you? Mr. Johnson didn't move. He stood like the statue. His mind was working, but his body was still. Hardly, I swallowed the lump in my throat due to the fear as beads of sweat started to form in my forehead. I'm such a chicken, I thought. I was chickening out already. I coughed loudly to announce my presence, and he turned to. Face with me, his bloodshot eyes. I screwed. I just disturbed a lunatic that wouldn't wait for a second to rip my head off my neck. What is it you want? He asked, his voice unfriendly. I want to talk with you. I said, as I exhaled heavily. I didn't realize I had held my breath since my eyes met his bloodshot eyes. I understand you don't want me here because I am a burden. You are a wonderful person. We all know something is wrong with you, and it's all because of the insufficient money in this family. I know how happy you were before it was closed down. You love your job. I know it. It energizes you and gives you happiness. But we are your family. Family, I said, emphasizing the last word. I decided to give him a pep talk. Maybe it would change him. Perhaps he needed someone to have faith in him. That things would turn out fine. We believe in you. You're a loving father, and know that deep inside you, you care, and I care about you no matter what. But drinking and drowning in your problem would only add to your sorrow, Dad. I said, and I immediately felt a hard slap across my face. Before I was savagely shoved 
to the wall. Well then, I guess I had spoken too much. Maybe I wasn't supposed to advise him. Maybe I wasn't supposed to care. I should have been in my room, locked up with my bio and basola. I felt my head suddenly heavy and saw a staggering figure coming my way with his fist clenched. He was drunk. He pounded on me, giving me hard blows on my body, not sparing me at all. How this happened? I didn't know. Some minutes ago, I was standing and showing how much I care, and the next, I was on the floor. Who the hell are you, hmm? You don't know what it feels like. Like. Blows continued to land on my face as he said each word. You think I am useless, hmm? Too soon? A hard punch met my nose, and I could feel the blood coming out of my nostrils. Was taking it out on me. I only wanted his way of reasoning to change. To view himself as a useful person, he got the wrong idea. You know what, Tosin? It's your decision to go to Ibadan, to stay with my sister, or stay here and get a hell of a beating when you cross your boundary with me. He was about to punch me again when Bayo spoke in with him now with a knife. His hand was trembling, was scared to death. He must have rushed to the kitchen to get that. You touch her again, and I promise to have you with this knife. Just leave her alone already. You got enough. She only cares about you. She misses you, and so do we. Just leave her alone. Mr. Johnson chuckled and shook his head. Is this timid Tussin that's telling you to, to be courageous and have the guts to talk back at me? He glared and walked toward them. N no, not her, Dad, Vasala said, shrieking and moving backwards to here. Back touched the wall. She is the one, right? he asked. Again, taking a slower step to meet Vasala was already looking back at the wall she was leaning against as if begging it to throw him out and conceal her in it, just temporarily. She shook her head vigorously, saying, Not just in dead, not just in. She slid down to the floor and used her arms as she healed to cover her head from getting it. Don't hit me, Dad, please, Isola said. Continuously begging as she sobbed, would refrain him from laying his fingers on her. He then moved to Bayo unexpectedly, slapped him across his face. You don't talk to your father anyhow. Have some respect. He bellowed. That was so fast that I knew if Bayo had seen that coming, he would have escaped the slap. He came back to me, glaring at me with his bloodshot eyes, and said, if you ever teach my children nonsense about disrespecting their father, you will see the other side of me. Haven't I seen enough? I thought as I held my swollen lips. Mr. Johnson mischievously smiled at me, giving me one savage kick in my eyes with pain and sadness. I began to feel the world spinning before welcoming the darkness. I slowly opened my eyes to a white painted room. The whole place was neat, so neat and bright. The instant thought that I was in heaven literally jerked me off from lying in the bed to having my butt sit on it. Oh my god, this can't be heaven. I was seriously not ready to die. I looked around me and I noticed I was getting a stalling infusion. Does heaven have hospitals? I must be crazy. I looked at my hand and removed the injection that was injected into my vein, which allowed the saline to pass into my body. I removed it as gently as I could, but unfortunately, blood came out immediately. Well then, I guess I might have done it the wrong way. I saw a ball of cotton wall nearby and took some and wiped the blood away. Having done that, I went to the door and curiously opened it. And there they were, Mr. Johnson, Vizala. Bio and Granny, seated as they held others' hand. 
were they dead to? Did my foster father beat them all to death after a blackout? So we are all here in heaven now? I coughed, and they look at me. Expressions, Leslie? Could it be that I was the one wanted? You can see me. Wait, what's stupid? I scoff at my foolishness, happy to realize I was alive since I could see blood coming out after I wrongly pulled out the injection accidentally from my vein. Well, I am alive. I thought I would smile. Zola and Bio came over and hugged me tightly and returned it, thinking I wouldn't trade them for anything. My adopted mom and granny came over likewise and we hugged. I'm so sorry for whatever my son did to you, Miss Viola Johnson said, sadness filling her eyes. I smiled and bobbed my head. Miss Viola Johnson was in her 80s, beautiful and generous. She was a wonderful woman who didn't cross her boundaries and loved being herself without interfering in another person's business. She was old and that was all she needed. It's okay, Mom, I said, giving her a reassuring smile. Can we just go to the cafeteria to eat and talk? Miss Ola suggested and her stomach grumbled. Sure, honey. We sat in a cafeteria eating hamburgers and soft drinks, except for my adopted mom who took coffee alone. I'm so sorry, Justin. I never should have refrained from not telling you sooner. It was selfish of me. And it was because I didn't want you to consider me as your adopted mother, but as your biological one. Confession time. Mrs. Rachel Jensen was 37 years of age, beautiful, loving, selfless, and above all strong. I adopted you when I was 25 years old. We were happily married. We waited for a year to have a child intentionally. We weren't rushing things, so when I turned 26 and still wasn't pregnant, I became worried. But then I was ready. It was my in my worried state that my sister-in-law, your aunt Sarah, suggested I adapt. She told me to pick you. I moved my head backwards and forward my eyebrows. I was shocked. Why did she suggest you pick me? Tessin let me finish. She didn't suggest. She insisted. She went to the orphanage with her friend who went to adopt. She said you were sad and hungry for love. She said she saw it in your eyes. And then your dad and I went to the orphanage and selected you. Did the necessary things to do before you were handed to us. But prior to that day, I saw your picture on her phone, which made me identify you easily. It was so cute. We treated you like you were like our own biological daughter. Three years later, I had battle, and then we saw after two years. See, I want you to know that your father loves you so much. He might probably be acting weird. Not probably, darling, but he is, Granny said. Oh my god, it's not my joy to see my son like that. Thinking he's so useless, and with the little he has left, he spent it on purchasing beers. I'm so worried. It's okay, mom, it's going to be fine, my adopted mother said to Granny as she held her hands. So, what do what do we do about Tess and Jen? I mean, she's not getting kicked out, right? Bisola inquired. No, she isn't. Listen, Tessin, you aren't my biological daughter. Fine, I just want you to view me as your real mother. Accept us as your family. Consider us, please. You are going to continue living with us and you are going to stay with my sister-in-law, okay? And your education continues right now. I haven't got any job as a high school teacher, so don't worry. I will work while your father wallows in his sorrow, spending his ill-left money on beers and perhaps women too. Who knows? Tassin, I want you to consider us as a family to you, please. I nodded. I thought this hard and the truth was just so plain. What more I could ask for? They loved me. Yeah, they were. They were my family and they would always be. Miss Rachel and Viola Jensen were no longer my adopted anything but my family. I smiled at them, thinking they were mine. I love you, Mom. I love you, Granny. And I love you, kiddos. I didn't know I was going to feel emotional that tears slipped down my face. I got this stretch three days after the incident happened and was brought home. Home? Was this a home? No, it was just a house. I had seen how it went. 
It was home but a house now. There were lots of crises at home. What I could do to establish what I could do, I asked myself countless times. I was a pathetic teenager who had fear running through her body. My mind flashed back to the what Bissola and Tuyun told me and how my siblings warned me too. I was stuck. Maybe the group could help. Ready? My mother asked. She placed her hand at the doorknob, smiling. I plastered a fake smile on my face. Yes. I was good at it, smiling fakely. Yes, ready, Mom, I said, and my heart pounded. She opened the door, and we both stepped inside the living room, only for me to be greeted with a bad memory of what had happened to me three days ago. I fainted, not lasting some seconds, that I got in. I guess I wasn't ready.